All right, everyone. So, so first of all, I just want to say that that guy in that photo with the long hair, that's definitely me. Up until about two months ago, I decided to cut all my hair short. I just wanted to put that out there, that's definitely me. And I've got all my social media links up there as well. I post some like articles about Postman and JavaScript related stuff on Medium. Um, I'm probably most active though on LinkedIn. So if you want to add me on those, feel free. So as it says there in the little JSON response at the bottom, uh, my name's Paul, I'm 30 years old. I'm from the UK and I've been calling myself a tester since 2012. So I'm currently the senior test analyst at Gear for Music and I've got a bunch of hobbies at the bottom as well. So you're probably wondering what this accent is. So when you think of a British accent, this is not really the accent that you kind of, I don't know, associate with like British or tea drinking, crumpet eating British people. I'm actually from a city in the northwest of England called Liverpool. It's about four or five hours away from London. And when you think of Liverpool, everyone always thinks of the Beatles, the most successful music app of all time, sold 178 million records worldwide. So a bit about my background as a tester. So I started out as a games tester back in 2012. I worked for Sony PlayStation, working on their first party titles. Um, as you can see, a lot of them are based around the Little Big Planet franchise, and those games were already shipped, so it was both mostly supporting them post-launch, so like testing all the downloadable content and making sure nothing had regressed. But it was just a lot of costume checks and making sure that you know other users couldn't you know, use the costumes that other users have, you know, purchased and downloaded. So I've done that for about two years, and then obviously Little Big Planet, if there's any game is Little Big Planet 3 came out, and then you're kind of in the waiting period whether am I gonna go on Little Big Planet 3 or is your contract gonna end? So I decided to take a big risk and get my first proper job in Manchester. So as I said, I'm currently working for Gear for Music. Gear for Music was launched in 2003. And we currently have about at least 25 developers, and we've just hired our sixth tester a couple of weeks ago. So Gear for Music is a, an online music retailer. We sell a variety of musical instruments, so like guitars, pianos, drum kits, as well as like stage equipment like lightning, uh, lighting kits, like smoke machines, DJ equipment, as well as audio workstations. As you can see in that first, um, first result there, that's our own brand guitar. So like we have our own branded gear for music uh, guitars and basses and whatnot. So if you just want us to pick up an instrument and learn, that's a really good starting place. So you're getting a, a gear for music branded guitar that comes with an amplifier, strap, cable, case, for just over $100, it's a really good deal. And we also have kind of like a much, a bit of a more premium brand. So Red Sub is our bass premium brand, which is also owned by gear for music. I'm not sure if there's any bass players in the audience, but you can buy a five string fan fret, multi-scale, bass guitar with active pickups for $229. That's an incredibly good deal. So I live in Liverpool, and that's about an hour's drive away from Manchester. Uh, our office is based in Manchester, so I've been doing that commute for five years, because all the places that I've worked, all the proper jobs I've worked, have been in Manchester. We also have another office and our warehouse in York. We also have a warehouse in Germany. And we also have a warehouse in Sweden as well, which, as you can tell, is the most metal country in the world. So here's how we work at Gear for Music. So as I said, we've got about at least 25 devs. So we've got this concept of squads. So we split the, the office up into five squads. Each squad has about five devs, um, ranging from like, your standard dev to a senior dev, a principal developer, and like, a, kind of like a dev lead. Um, so each squad is assigned one QA. So as I said before, we've got six uh, testers. So we've got all the testers are in a squad minus the test lead, who's like more of like a support and management role. And then each squad also is also assigned a project manager and a BA, and their squad is just solely focused on delivering their project. So let's talk about my history of Postman. Uh, like Abin, I've said before, there's quite a few people who've been using it for like years and years. Uh, I was kind of like an early adopter. I've been using it since 2012, which I'll discuss in a minute. So as I said before, after I left the games industry, I started working in Manchester, and I worked for a company called Inventive IT that eventually got bought out and became Advam UK. And Inventive IT, we were responsible for creating uh, like booking journey websites, for mostly for airports, so they could book airport car parking. I know that sounds really dull, going from 
playing games for a living to testing air, airport car park and websites, but surprisingly, it was really enjoyable. So it's just a standard booking journey website. You put in some, you know, and so you're dating the time, you select the terminal, you click find parking, and then you get a bunch of like search results, and you add them to your basket, et cetera, et cetera. And that was also backed by this thing called an API. So I had no technical background whatsoever other than probably making MySpace pages back in the day. So coming from games testing and that to learning what an API was was a huge step for me. And since I didn't know what an API was, I had no idea how to test it. So I was literally just recreating the requests that were made on the front end in the Swagger documentation, looking at the response body and going, yeah, that probably looks about right. Move the ticket into done. So as you can imagine, a lot of issues found. <laughs> so the CTO at, uh, at Inventive IT at the time was Nick Southworth. He suggested this cool up and coming tool called Postman. So this was around about 2015, 2014. And there was like nothing online about it other than the official docs. So I think these two YouTube videos were the only ones that were existed talking about Postman. So with me, that didn't have a technical background. So that was quite frustrating, but also really rewarding because there was a ton of trial and error. And that's kind of how my relationship with Postman, the company, evolved. So I didn't, want to, um, I didn't want anyone else to kind of go through the same struggles that I did or fear of asking the stupid question. So back in the day, we had a, a Postman Slack channel, and I was pretty active on that. And I think since I'm from the UK, I had the benefit of you know, the UK time zone. So whenever someone asked a question, I was straight in there answering them. And it got to the point where people were just directly DMing me rather than speaking to the Postman team themselves. And also, I'm not sure if you guys know who that character is. That's Postman Pat. He's a kid's TV show in the UK. He's basically a mailman that goes around the countryside in the UK delivering people's mail and getting up to all sorts of shenanigans. I basically tried to find a heavy metal version of Postman Pat, but one with sunglasses was the best I could do. So once we kind of um, we dropped this, the Postman Slack channel, we Postman created the community forum. And I was pretty active on that as well. So when I last spoke for uh, the Postman Customer Summit, which is where I got this hoodie from, um, back in February, I was number one. And I was kind of like putting a dig at Danny Dayton, who's, who actually works for Postman. He's also a fellow British man. But um, when I checked to do an update of the slide, I was now knocked down to number two. So I've got to put that there and you know, shout out to Danny Dayton for that. <laughs> All right, so enough talk. Let's find out how I'm actually using Postman at for Music with some code examples. So I joined the business back in December 2018. And before that, so an API could exist, but we didn't have the skill set on the test team to actually test that API directly. So it was just mostly testing it at the end, so once like the front end had been built. So as you can imagine, there's some things that are, exist in the API that aren't really exposed on the front end. And that's kind of where my skill set comes in. So wherever I've worked, I've always been kind of known as the postman guy. So that I've always wanted to kind of bring this early testing idea into Gear for Music as well. Um, funny enough, I've actually got an article on my Medium about it, so you can check that out. And basically, if this can be as simple, of, simple as asking questions when you're designing um, API like schemas or response bodies, um, or even if, even if you're designing like you know the front end, it's just asking like, well oh, that button's green, but it's blue on every other page. Even that can be considered early testing. So one of the cool things um, at Gear for Music is that, so in a sprint we could have like a spike task that the devs would do, and they would construct a what what they want the response body to look like, or kind of a basic idea of what they want it to look like, as well as a JSON schema. So once they've kind of finished this spike task, that's when the devs start writing code to make, make that exist. But the cool thing about Postman is I can actually start writing tests then. So before that ticket even comes into QA, I can prepare tests. So I'm not sure if anyone attended one of the, work, the workshop upstairs yesterday, where they were um, talking about like JSON schemas and stuff and how you can test it in Postman. This is like super helpful. So as well as the whole mocking service. So basically what I would do is, I would take uh, this example response body, which would be like in Confluence, or it could just be posted in Slack or something like that, or even in the Jira ticket itself, once the spike task has been completed. I can copy that. I can create a Postman mock that returns that response, and I can start writing tests for it. So as soon as that ticket goes into QA, all I have to do now is just switch the environment from the mock environment to the dev environment. 
And then if obviously if there's any failures, that can start ask, you can start asking questions like, well, I based, based my test based on this agreed assumption, and I would assume that this dev has also you know, coded based on the same assumption of the response body. As well as JSON schemas, um, one of the workshops yesterday talked about uh, collection variables. So this is one thing that I've always kind of struggled in Postman. So if I want to write an assertion that says, all right, I want to expect the response body to match this JSON schema. Um, it was kind of like, well, where, does the, where should that JSON schema lie in Postman? So obviously, you could copy and paste it into every single request, but obviously, maintenance nightmare. So what I've done is I've just taken all the response bodies that I used in my collection, put them at the topmost level, and then just assign them to environment variables so I can just call them whenever I want. And then they're all in one place then, which makes it a lot easier to maintain. There's also a really good article there that I've referenced as well that, that does this better than me, in my opinion, but I just haven't got around to doing it yet. So I just wanted to plug that because it seems like it's really cool. So yeah, in December when I joined Gear for Music, they uh, wanted to improve the returns process, both, based, both from a customer perspective and like a customer service perspective. They wanted to make it a lot more efficient. And that was backed with uh, an API. So one of my favorite things to do is to kind of jump in head first. So the project was kind of like 10, 20% or already there. Some API endpoints existed. So it's kind of like, right, I have no idea about this company or this software. I want to start writing tests. Where do I begin? So what I would do is I'll just take the core functionality of the returns project, and I'll just create these uh, subfolders in Postman, and I'll put all the, API, the relevant API endpoints in them, which I'll show in a minute. So the returns project is kind of based, it's broken down into like a returns folder. So that can be like simply creating a return in our database. So like, you know, so you, a customer may have bought a, the wrong guitar or it's, it's arrived and it's broken. They want to create a return. And that's, that's what would be in there, as well as things like editing the return reason. So the, the customer might have made a mistake. So all those scenarios would go in there. The second one is URNs, unique reference number. So as soon as the item is returned and it's in our warehouse, we need a way to track it. So all the tests relating to URNs would be in there, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so these kind of actors, I know this says regression tests, but they can also kind of act as like a smoke test. So whenever a dev creates a, a new environment with a fix on, I run all these tests. And if any of these fail, then that, that uh, Jira ticket goes straight into failed. Like it, it just doesn't even pass go. So I'm going to expand the returns folder right now. So yesterday, during one of the workshops, someone in the audience said, um, is there a way to write, uh, to have a bunch of tests or requests run uh, as kind of like a prerequisite? And the person doing the demo said no. And inside, I was like, yes, because that's what my talk's on. <laughs> so bear in mind, it's pretty hacky. But I've been doing this for about a year now, and I've had junior QA people that have understood it and are able to maintain it. So I'll show you what, what that's all about. So basically, a prerequisite to all these tests, so, it, so A1, A2, A3, A4, and A5, you need to create a return. So I'm, I'm sure most of you guys can do this, where you would create like one thing. So it could be like you create a user, and then you've got all your tests that kind of snowball after it. And if one of them fails in the chain, then it's kind of, you know, it gets a bit messy. So I'm getting around that by kind of replicating this kind of you know, hook. So if you're using a test framework like Mocha, Jest, um, Ruby RSpec, they have this idea of, oh, before, before each, after, after each. I, want, I wanted to replicate that in Postman. So let's expand the, the first two subfolders. So as you can see there, um, I've got this, this request called A0 setup. So let's look at that. So on the community forum, uh, Danny Dayton has actually posted a way to clear out environment variables. And I can't remember if this is actually copied and pasted from your code, so sorry if I'm plagiarizing. But basically, um, I, I was having issues where like, I would have a test run, and then obviously you've got, all the, you've got all this persistent data in your environment. And when you try and rerun certain tests, you kind of got test data from previous runs. I think I've called it test bleed. I'm not sure if that's an actual term, but if not, it should be, because it sounds cool. So basically, what it does is this function called clear variables. It just looks for all the variables in my in the environment. If it's if it's got URL in it or if it's auth token, then null absolutely everything apart from those two. Um, it did used to uh, clear the environment variables, but we found out we had issues with other testers because it was actually deleting 
the variables during their test run if we were running tests at the same time. So that's why we're nulling it, because that's obviously nulling only the current value. So that's the value that the, the actual test is looking at on their machine. Also, one thing that's really important is line 22. So I've got this environment variable called target test suite, and I'm also setting that to null. So this target test suite is quite uh, important in how I'm using Postman at the minute. So let's look at the last request in this before reach. So let's just go through the chain. So first of all, we clear all environment variables. Then we've got like we've got another request that returns all orders for a specific email address that I'm giving it. So I put in my email email address, and it just shows like an array of objects of all the orders that I've placed. Picks the first one, and it gets all the items on that order. And then the last two is where the actual the actual return is created. So there'll be a form that the customer service user uh, populates. They click create return, and that's the, basically the request that it's, make, that it's made. So let's look at that last request. So if you remember before, we, got this, um, we had this target test suite variable. I know it was null before. So if you can see here, we've also got this nasty looking switch statement. This is the first switch statement that I've ever written. And I've, I've never really had a use case to have another one, but it, it, re it works really well in Postman. So basically what it's doing is, it's, look, it's looking at the value of target test suite variable, which is null at the first run. And it's looking to see, right, right does target test suite, is it, oh, does it match the value of overdue? No. Settled? No. Resolved? No. Return reason? No. Done? No. So it executes the code that's in the default uh, case. So I can see that's using Postman set next request, which, in my opinion, is the most probably uh, overlooked feature in Postman. It's, it's, it's like it's, it's saved so much time for me. But I think I've also put in the side as well that it's, it's probably kind of pointless to put set next request in that scenario because we're naturally going to go to the next folder. So as you can see there, um, all the tests in A0 are run, and we would naturally go to A1. So once the return's been created, um, it calls the get one return request and makes sure that all the data is correct in the response body. As well, it checks the activity log to say that oh, this user has created this specific return, and then it does another test as well. But this is the last request in this A1 subfolder. So let's look at that. So now what it does is um, we're using Postman set next request again. But instead of naturally going to the second subfolder, which would be A2, we're telling it to jump back to our before hook. So that way, we've got to create a fresh return for every single test scenario. So we haven't got this kind of big snowball, big ball of mud effect. And on top of that, I've got this target test suite variable, which I'm setting to overdue. So if you remember from the, uh, the switch statement, if it's overdue, we're, it's, we're now saying, oh, if it's overdue, go to the A2 folder. So let's look at that switch statement again. So yeah, as we said, target test suite has now been set to overdue. So that matches the second case on line uh, 10. So instead of naturally going to A1, we're just going to go to A2. So we've got another fresh return to work with and do some tests. So this would be uh, the, the actual flow of the full test. So we run all the, all the requests in A0 first. Then we run all the requests in A1. We use Postman send next request to jump back to A0. So that, that A0 folder is acting as a before each hook. And then we've got a new return, and it's jumping over A1, and it's running the, the, uh, the request in A2. And then once it's done A2, it's going to jump back to A0. And it's going to keep doing that for all the scenarios that we've got in there, which, as you can see, we've got 196 requests. I'm not sure if that seems like a lot for you guys, but if you can imagine if I'm copying and pasting or if I'm duplicating that create return request all the time, it's, it's going to be a maintenance nightmare. And if, you, if, one of the, if that API endpoint um, like it changes or you need to update a test, you have to update it in every single request, and it's just it's a pain point for me. And trying to keep your tests dry or, maintain, or easy to maintain as possible has kind of been like one of the biggest struggles in Postman. To, but yeah. <laughs> and this is how we went from zero to 1,000 tests. Thank you very much, everyone. So um, like they said before, I'll probably be stood over there during the break. So if you want to speak to me about testing, uh, music, heavy metal, whatever, feel free to grab me.